Welcome, and thank you for joining us for a conversation with E. Patrick Johnson, the creator of the film Making Sweet Tea. I want to begin by thanking Joe Ford of the Athenaeum at Virginia Tech, Dominique Francesca, the business manager of the Center for Humanities, and Trevor Samraj, who's the graduate assistant with the Center for Humanities, for their work in helping us to create this event. We're truly excited and we're deeply honored to have with us today E. Patrick Johnson. E. Patrick Johnson is the Dean of the School of Communication at Northwestern University, where he holds the Carlos Montezuma Chair as Professor of Performance Studies and African American Studies. He is a scholar and an artist. Uh, he performs nationally and internationally, and he's published widely in the areas of race, gender, sexuality, and performance. Johnson is a prolific performer and, and scholar. He's an inspiring teacher. His research and artistry have greatly impacted African American studies. He's an award winning author. He's written Appropriating Blackness Performance and the Politics of Authenticity, it was published in 2003. That book won the Lilla Heston Award, the Errol Hill Book Award, and it was a finalist for the Hurston Wright Legacy Award. He's authored the book Sweet Tea Black Gay Man of the South, an Oral History published in 2008. Uh, this was recognized as a Stonewall Book Award honor book by the LGBT Roundtable of the American Library Association. But he's written many other books. He's co-edited with Meiji Henderson, Black Queer Studies, a critical anthology. He's also the editor of Cultural Struggles, Performance, Ethnography, Praxis by Dwight Conkergood. And he's co-editor with Ramon Rivera Cebrera, of solo black woman scripts, interviews, and essays, and No Tea, No Shade, New Writings in Black Queer Studies. And he's co-edited Black Tino Queer Performance, also with Ramon Rivera Severa. And he recently published uh, the creative nonfiction text, Black Queer Southern Women and Oral History, as well as Honeypot, Black Southern Women Who Love Women. So uh, welcome. E. Patrick, so glad to have you here. It is so great to be here and to be joined back with you, my fellow colleague who we had here at Northwestern for so many years. It's great to be with you and I'm gonna work to steal you back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, it, it's a pleasure to uh, to be able to reconnect with you as well, E. Patrick. It was it, quite an honor to be at Northwestern so many years that were very formative so uh, very excited about our talk today. So thank you so much for joining us. Good to be here. So we're gonna talk about your award-winning film, Making Sweet Tea. Now you were uh, very effective in allowing us to be able to have this screening for the film, Making Sweet Tea, just a few days ago. So that screened on Friday evening. And uh, hopefully many of our viewers who are watching now were able to see that screening. Uh, the film is very powerful. And there's so many things uh, about the content of the film as well as what surrounds it that we're eager to hear you talk about. So I thought we could start by asking you to talk with our viewers about your work as a professional scholar, as a creative artist, and now most recently also a film creator. Hmm. What is it like to span those different dimensions of professional work? It's interesting, um, Sylvester, because I, I can't conceive of traditional scholarly work without thinking about its uh, artistic potential. And I can't think of creating artistic work without uh, a kind of intellectual or research question driving it. So for me, those things go hand in hand. When I first started, um, as an assistant professor even, things would come to me, uh, ideas would come to me in the form of a play, for instance, because I'm, I'm mostly a, a solo performer. And then in the middle of writing that script, the muse would say, this is not the form I wanna be in, I need to be an essay. <laughs> and so the, the essay that I uh, probably am most known for, uh, which is called, queer studies or almost everything I know about queer studies I learned from my grandmother actually started out as a performance piece that 
ended up being, you know, uh, uh, in a traditional uh, essay format, although parts of that essay um, have creative components to it. And so I have always been the kind of um, academic who considered himself a scholar and an artist and didn't really privilege one or the other, but being uh, hired in a department that required a book <laughs> to get tenure, I did have to initially focus you know, on more traditional scholarship, um, but I never gave up the artistic um, side uh, of, of who I am. And so um, one of the things that I've tried to do as I have um, moved you know, through the, the rank and file uh, assistant associate, full professor, now administrator, is open up a space for um, scholars and artists to also have their work validated in a way that doesn't force them to privilege one or the other. And to actually teach um, colleagues, both at Northwestern and outside, uh, how to evaluate artistic work as scholarship, and also uh, ways to find the artistic within traditional scholarship. Uh, for instance, you know, we, we live in a, uh, a world in which to engage our students, we have to find you know, creative ways to, uh, to teach them. Some of that is through, you know, uh, mediated forms through technology. Uh, and, you know, I'm not a Luddite, but I'm also not the first one to, you know, embrace all forms of technology, but I am aware of how we need to really diversify the way in which we um, disseminate and create knowledge. And so what I've done um, is uh, adopted what my um, colleague and co-executive uh, uh, producer of Making Sweet Tea, John Jackson, calls multimodal forms of knowledge. Uh, and I find that uh, it's a it's a way to not only embrace the artistic and the scholarly and not create a false binary between them, but it's also a way to engage different kinds of audiences. Uh, and I know we'll talk about this a little bit uh, uh, later in the conversation, but I know for instance that people who might pick up the book Sweet Tea may not be the, the same who would come see the film may not be the same who would come see the play. Um, and each of those mediums do a different kind of work. And, and also thinking about um, the ways in which uh, Black folk in particular uh, create and disseminate knowledge um, historically has been through the oral tradition. So not all of our culture, not all, all of our community are literate. So reading a book would you know, be a non-starter but they might come to a performance and they might watch a film. So it's important to me that I engage these multimodal forms so that the, the research that I do and the uh, artistry that I do uh, reach the widest number of people. And also that it um, uplifts the very people uh, that I'm uh, on the, on um, it reaches the, the, the same people, the very people that I'm doing the research on and trying to provide a platform for. Well, it is very effective that you're working across these different areas and genres. Uh, when I watched the film, it was really moving to observe so many different elements. You reveal in the film that you grew up in Hickory, North Carolina. Uh, and some years ago, as viewers will see in this film, the town actually honored you for your accomplishments by naming E. Patrick Johnson Day and having a public event. And we get to see you reflecting on the significance of your 
experience growing up there as well as your engagement with the individuals you're interviewing in the film. What was the journey like <laughs> um, those childhood days to now? And I'm wondering if you could say something about what inspired you? Well, you know, it journey is the appropriate word because it, it definitely has been a journey um, from growing up in a small um, rural town in Western North Carolina where, you know, there's not um, a large African-American population. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it was a town that was segregated by a railroad track, um, you know, which is a common trope uh, in African-American arts and letters. Um, and also in a, in a town that really um, appreciated the, the sense of community, even though we were segregated, um, it was a very tight knit black community. And I never felt, even though we were, you know, we lived in abject poverty, you know, uh, eight people growing up in a, you know, living in a one bedroom apartment that we rented uh, from um, these uh, store owners named the Zerdens, uh, who was a Jewish family that owned a, uh, a number of department stores where they uh, allowed Black folks credit. They gave them, you know, would allow them to purchase um, clothing. One of the few places that would allow Black people to um, purchase clothing from their store on credit. Um, but they also owned housing in uh, my community, which was called Ridgeview. And um, that community really bonded together to make sure that its children, even though they could not attend uh, the white high schools, that they received um, an education uh, at the Black High School at Ridgeview um, high. And in fact, my, uh, even though, you know, Brown versus board uh, was in uh, 55, it, would, it wasn't until 1973 that uh, Hickory City Schools were fully integrated. And so my first grade class was the first class um, to be to, to mark the, the integration of schools 18 years <laughs> after Brown first supported education. So that's sort of the, the, the historical context in which I grew up. Mm -hmm. And yet I never felt uh, like I missed anything um, because I had these, I, I call them black oracles. <laughs> um, there were three black women um, whose names, you know, they've, they've now since passed away, but I, I, their names I will call. Z. Ann Hoyle, who was actually the first black woman to sit on the city council in Hickory, and she's responsible for the celebration of e. Pat, Dr. E. Patrick Johnson Day. Miss um, um, Catherine Tucker, who also a school teacher, um, who um, passed away a few years ago, and Miss Flossie Sadler, also a teacher. Those three black women single-handedly made sure that all the children in the Ridgeview community had exposure to African-American literature, to African-American theater, uh, to black culture in general, and uh, would um, make us have poetry contests. Uh, they put on plays. Um, and so it was, it was a vibrant, rich community. Um, we all shared the same pots. <laughs> uh, you know, our um, mothers were the mothers of not of just their children, but everybody else's children. So if you got in trouble, uh, you got more than one whooping. <laughs> um, so it, it was that kind of close knit community. And because I believe in simultaneous truths. It was also a, a space where I didn't feel comfortable being gay. And so the, the, the reckoning for me, the journey was 
on the one hand, really um, honoring the significance of what it meant for this community to celebrate uh, my, my earning a PhD and what that meant for that community in the eyes of the white folk on the other side of the tracks. So I got it. On the other hand, um, there was a part of my own spirit that died that day because I wasn't out to them. And I knew, or I felt that if I had been out, they may not have had the celebration at all. So trying to um, reconcile both of those things was my own journey. And um, in the making of this film, one of the things that John Jackson said to me uh, was, you know, you got to tell your story. <laughs> uh, you know, you got to go back home and you got to deal with, with your demons. Mm -hmm. And as an oral historian and as an ethnographer, that was one of the biggest lessons that I had to learn. And that is not until I turned the microphone back toward myself, mm -hmm. did I understand the, um, the magnitude of what I had asked of these men. Mm. They, I had asked of them to share the most intimate details of their lives, the tensions uh, with family members, with partners, and so on and so forth. And I had to do the same. And, and it wasn't until I had to do it that I understood <laughs> the significance of that. And so part of the, the journey was going back as an openly gay man uh, years later and uh, confronting, you know, um, my community. And um, in some ways, the journey that Charles has in the film is, is sort of running parallel with my own because there is a way in which I think people can watch this film and they, they're moved by Charles' story, but they feel sorry for him. Um, but I think I actually say this in the, in the film. There are some ways in which Charles was uh, much braver than I uh, was because he, he stayed there. He lived, he stood in what he thought was his truth at the time. Um, in a way that I didn't because I had moved away and I was you know, uh, living the life of an academic, but not fully standing in my truth in my hometown. So I think that was uh, uh, the difference. So that personal journey um, was something that sort of unfolded over the course of the, the um, making of the film. It wasn't something that we thought was going to be in it uh, when, when John uh, had the idea for the film, but it sort of evolved and, and was made, was revealed to us uh, as it were, uh, that it had to be a part uh, of that journey. The other thing is um, we felt very strongly that the men themselves um, had to had to be collaborators in the film, and not collaborators in the sense that they they just um, agree to be in it, but that they have a say in how they were represented, and um, how the film would be edited um, on the back end, and so they've been a part of this journey as well, from the original interview. Um, to the making of the film. And that was really important to all of us on the team that they really feel as if they had some agency in uh, how they were being represented. And so, you know, they saw many rough cuts of the film, uh, gave us feedback um, about various uh, parts of it. Um, 
and they vetoed some things. <laughs> they took out, you know, some uh, photos that we wanted to use and um, and on the back end, they've been a part of the, um, as we've done the film festivals, uh, they've been a part of those um, talkbacks. Uh, and uh, one of them, Freddie, has actually traveled with me uh, uh, to uh, out of town to a film festival. It was just the two of us representing the film. Uh, and he was planning to go with me to Paris because our film got accepted to a film festival there in April. Uh, but alas, you know, COVID dashed our dreams. Um, so the journey has been one of um, kind of uh, my own personal journey, uh, but it's also been a journey that I've walked hand in hand with these men as well. And um, as Sweet Honey and the Rock uh, says in their song, wouldn't take nothing from my journey now. Uh, and I wouldn't. It's been um, a very um, self-reflexive process um, that I think has made me a, a better scholar, a better artist, uh, and a better teacher. Well, you just, you mentioned a couple of things that I was wondering about as I watched the film. Um, and that is just what's involved in this process of creating the film, both from a technical perspective, because you, you just alluded to the fact that this began with the interviews, uh, but then there was a process of bringing this all together. For example, I was, I was struck by the music. I mean, it's beautiful throughout the film, as well as the staging and the setup, because it, it's about the lives of the people you're interviewing. Uh, but as you indicated, your story is there as well. And they're woven together in such a, a brilliant and intricate way that feels very organic and smooth for the view. For the it view. was not. <laughs> That's part of the craft of filmmaking <laughs> is, to, is to make it look smooth. I, I imagine that it actually is incredibly difficult. Do you remember how many hours of footage you started with? Yes, yeah, so when we finally decided to stop and say, you know, we can't film anymore, we had 80 hours. Wow. <laughs> 80 hours of raw footage that is now distilled down to 88 minutes. So you can imagine and one of the challenges that we had was trying to figure out how to tell all those different threads of the story. So it was, it is a film about the making of the play. Mm -hmm. So that's one through line. It is about my own journey back home and, you know, me uh, having this reckoning with my, um, my hometown. Uh, it is about what has happened to these men since the original interview. And the experimental component, um, which uh, John always wanted to have, was me performing the men's story in front of them, in their homes, on their jobs, um, where they um, went to church, or whatever the case might be. And so finding a way to merge all of those storylines together where it felt organic, so I'm glad to hear you say that it did, um, was a real challenge because, you know, we had a number of different ways that we could have told the story and um, finding that sweet spot was really um, a challenge. I will say that the music helped and um, a Professor, Guthrie Ramsey uh, at the University of Pennsylvania composed the music. Um, he and uh, a collaborator uh, named um, Vince Anthony, uh, they did that score in like three weeks. Wow. Yes. And what they did was they watched the film and they created a um, they compose music for each of the men. Mm -hmm. So whenever you see Duncan or you see Freddie, they have their specific intro music. And then um, 
Vince had already recorded a version of uh, His Eyes on the Sparrow. And we asked him, when we decided to use the, the graveyard scene, we asked them to extend uh, that version a little bit. Um, and they did. And that's one of the more moving um, moments. I mean, there are many, but that's one of the more moving moments uh, of the film for me is watching me walk through the graveyard and having him um, sing that song. Um, and so, yeah, the music really added yet another level, another layer of meaning and texture um, to the film. Um, but it took five years to make this film. Wow. Um, because, uh, we did it all out of pocket. You know, we we wrote many grants and, you know, didn't get any money. So we were doing out of our own research accounts, our own pocket. Um, John had a, a team of students who was uh, helping uh, film some of it. Uh, my husband, Stephen Lewis, <clears throat> excuse me, ended up uh, editing the film at the last minute because our original editor had a a family uh, drama um, crisis. Uh, I think he, uh, our first editor got it from 80 hours to two and a half hours. Uh, and then um, Stephen had to take over uh, and he's the one that got it down to 88 minutes. Um, so it has been, you know, quite uh, <laughs> a, um, collaborative and um, intense process. Um, film is was new to me. And as I will say this uh, on the record, uh, as a performer, actor, I hate film. <laughs> How <laughs> ironic. <laughs> Because it's it's not like live theater at all. You have to do things so many times over and over again. One of the one of the um, the the words that I kept hearing throughout the, the filming was uh, it has to be there has to be continuity. So, for instance, if you're sitting at a chair and you have a, a glass of tea, um, that glass of tea has to remain at the same level in every shot. So if you're drinking it, it has to be filled to the same level so that in the next cut, that glass of tea is at the same level. But that could mean, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine takes over and over again. So and as, as an actor, it's, it makes it more difficult to sort of drop inside a character because you may have to stop because maybe the sound isn't rolling or, you know, and you might be, you know, really in it, but you have to stop, start over, do it again. And in any way, you got to do it uh, multiple times because they need different angles. They need B-roll. So I actually learned to appreciate um, television and film actors much more <laughs> uh, having gone through this process. Uh, it's really, really interesting. And then the other thing is, Filmmakers are daring. They're out running in the streets, being chewed off by police if they don't, you know, have a permit to be out there recording. But they're fearless because for them, getting the perfect shot is uh, their priority. Mm -hmm. So the the um, image of the train when I'm walking down the train track, that's in Hickory, mm -hmm. where they still have trains going down that track, as you see, and so. We didn't know when the train was going to come or not. They just wanted me on the tracks walking. And so when the train started coming, the um, the guy who was uh, filming that day was like, we got to get the, we got to get the train, we got to get the train. So he's running, uh, trying to beat the train <laughs> with a, a camera on his shoulder so that he can get the perfect shot for when the train comes by. And I'm sitting there like, this man is crazy. <laughs> but for them, you know, it's all about the art. Um, mm. So I really gained a, 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 a rich appreciation for filmmaking and for uh, all that goes into um, 
creating a film because it's more than a notion. It is more than a notion. But I think what we ended up with uh, is something that we can all be very, very proud of. It, it is amazing. And I'm, I'm so excited to have been able to see the film and those who were able to screen it with us. Uh, and it's, it's no wonder when I watched it, I quickly realized why it's already won so many awards. I mean, this film just came out in 2019 and it's already racking them up. Um, so that's, that is such a rich and powerful moving piece. I'm wondering, cause you, so you talked a little bit about your work as an ethnographer. So you've, for a long time, your work has been rooted in ethnographic research where you're really sitting with, immersing yourself with your research subjects and interviewing them and capturing their lives and then interpreting that in your scholarship for our larger public to understand and to appreciate. And one of the things that ethnographers are always concerned about is, is the ethics of that process. You know, it's one thing if you're writing about people who lived 200 years ago or 500 years ago, um, if, if they're concerned about what we're writing about them, it's hard to tell because <laughs> they're, they're dead, right? But when people are alive, uh, they're, there are immediate consequences for just capturing their information because these are people. It's not the same thing as, as reading a newspaper article from the 1800s. Right. And then there's also the presentation of it. And so I'm struck by your explaining the process where you actually included your research subjects in the making of the film. Um, even, even just thinking of going from 80 something hours to, to 88 minutes is, is mind boggling. And that's when I'm assuming that most filmmakers, they don't actually involve research subjects. They just sit down, they do their film with a small team of people yep. so they can get it done. Yep. So how did you decide to make this even more difficult than it already is <laughs> by including the research subjects in the, the crafting of, in some of the decisions for editing that got made in, in creating the film? And was there ever a time when you felt like you had, I want to say, lost control or it, it became something other than maybe what you had at first imagined and then you found yourself beholding to this decision that it was going to be a lot of people involved in the editing? Yeah, so for me, I'm always guided by my own personal, ethical, and moral imperative to do no harm and to um, provide a platform for uh, communities uh, who don't typically have a platform to speak. Mm -hmm. So I'm not um, at all interested in, and uh, what I'm about to say is this has been, you know, theorized critique in anthropology um, for uh, a while now because of its colonial history. But I've never been a scholar invested in going into a community, a culture, uh, treating them as objects, collecting their stories, talking about their culture, and then going back, writing it up, and that's it. For me, there's always been about um, collaboration. Um, and also acknowledging the ways in which the power dynamic shifts between a researcher and the other. Um, I'll take my grandmother for as a, a case example. So my, um, my dissertation was an oral history of my grandmother's life as a domestic worker. And, you know, one might think, oh, that's, you know, sort of easy because, you know, you just sit down and talk to your grandmother. Well, no. <laughs> so I, I went to live with my grandmother uh, in her small apartment in a little town called Kings Mountain, North Carolina, which is on the border of North and South Carolina. And um, it was a fascinating um, experiment being there as a graduate student, a PhD student, as the, you know, the expert and the scholar, 
but most importantly, I was the grandson. And so I was at the mercy of my grandmother and, you know, when she wanted to talk, when she didn't want to talk, you know, uh, and sometimes, you know, I would be listening to her and she would say, now put that pen down, boy, I'm, I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> and so I obeyed my grandmother. Um, and for me, that dynamic actually became fodder for me to theorize the ways in which power shifts uh, between researchers and those who are the um, subjects of the research and that they do have agency and they should have agency in how the very process of collecting their uh, stories um, should work and then how it's represented. And so for this project, it was, um, I wouldn't say um, we felt obligated, but we felt, we did felt compelled to uh, include the men as much as possible in the decisions that was going to be made about how we represented them. And it was an ethical decision. Because um, the other thing is for the book, it was, um, you know, there was no video, component. there was no visual component. Um, but film is a game changer. Your likeness is going to be seen, you know, around the world, literally. And so it was important to all of us that they have a say in how they were represented. Did it become challenging sometimes? Yes, because um, there were there were things that we were thinking. Oh my goodness, this is so compelling. This is going to be great. That then the men would say oh, no, I don't want you to include that. And we had to honor that. Um, I think the most interesting thing uh, about that dynamic, however, relates to Charles. Charles went from not ever coming to a uh, reading uh, from the book, or uh, he was invited multiple times to be a part of the of talkbacks for the play. And um, I think he actually says this in the film, you know, he did not, he did not uh, attend any of those things because he was not ready. But when we started filming and I reached out to Charles, not only did he uh, decide that he, he would be filmed, um, but he also <laughs> arranged for us to, um, film in the place where he had performed. He also uh, got one of his customers to agree to come in so that we could shoot him um, doing hair. So this was someone who went from not wanting to be involved in this at all to doing a total 180 uh, and really um, shaping the film in a way that I think gave us the sort of dramatic climax of the film. Uh, because without Charles's story, this would have been a very different film uh, because his journey is so compelling and so fascinating, but also so moving. Um, I think this would have been a very different film without him. Um, and that's why, you know, uh, he's on the cover, you know, he's this backdrop of, of, uh, of the film, uh, that moment in the club where he says, it was like looking at myself in the mirror. And it just so happened that uh, my husband was filming uh, my reflection in the mirror that's sort of trifurcated. <laughs> I mean, it, all, the, all the stars aligned. <laughs> um, but had it not been for Charles, we never would have had that scene because he's the one that arranged for us to actually shoot in that club where Chastity performed. So um, the same with Duncan uh, arranging to, for us to shoot in his church uh, for me to perform. 
uh, or um, Freddie giving me a tour of you know downtown Decatur, uh, where he would frequent certain bars and everyone knew him. So um, I think having the men sort of guide us actually added to as opposed to took away uh, from the film, but it also, um, uh, as you noted, did um, give us some challenges <laughs> along the way um, as we, um, you know, wanted to include things that we ultimately couldn't. Well, I know uh, some viewers who've experienced this beautiful and moving film might wonder about the cultural and symbolic significance of sweet tea if if they're not already familiar with that it's very important of course as implied by the name of the film and the inclusion of making sweet tea and sharing sweet tea in the film itself can you talk about that for a moment yes so you know growing up uh we, there were two constants in my household, Kool-Aid <laughs> and sweet tea. And I, uh, I don't really drink either anymore because for me, they're like diabetes in a glass, <laughs> if they're made correctly. Um, but the, 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 significant, um, the, the significance of sweet tea to Southern culture um, and the, the ways in which it's incorporated into the food ways of Southern life um, for those hot summers um, and how it's a part of how we break bread in the South. And then how uh, Black gay folks sort of uh, made it a part of their culture by referring to tea as gossip. Um, you know, what's the tea, spill the tea. Um, and so it takes on all these different reference um, in, um, in the South in particular. And so when we were trying to come up with the name for the uh, film, um, we didn't want it just to be, you know, we have already had Sweet Tea, the book, we had Sweet Tea, the play. So we wanted to come up with something um, a little different. And so I came up with the idea of making Sweet Tea because originally the film was about the making of the play, but also it became this sort of meta commentary about what it means to actually make Sweet Tea because most everybody in the film make tea, uh, but we were also making the film mm -hmm. and we're also talking about making of the play, but it's also about the making of black queer culture. So it's operating on all those different registers. And of course there's lots of tea being spilled <laughs> um, in the film as well. And um, so the, the significance to um, the film and to the men uh, becomes, it's, I think it's sort of um, like the process of making uh, tea itself, you know, the film sort of evolves over the course of those 88 minutes so that we have something that has been steeped, uh, that has been, uh, had a little water added to it that has been sweetened. Um, there's been uh, some bitterness. There's been some um, libations uh, and there's different um, colors. You know, when my, you know, my, I love my mother uh, <laughs> opening the film with making her version uh, of tea. Um, but what got edited from the film is I asked her, well, how do you know when it's ready? And she said, it, you, you just look at the color. <laughs> when it's the right color, you know. Uh, it's the way, you know, that lots of black people who don't use recipes, you know, you just a little this, a little that, you know. So she said, it's, it's the right color. And so 
the the tea metaphorically does change colors over the course of the film as well. You know, how we make tea, how we make community, how we make culture um, is not always the same. And everyone puts their little spin on it. And so um, that's why we ultimately decided to um, really uh, mine that metaphor for as much uh, as we could um, with m calling the, the film Making Sweet Tea. You know, it communicates powerfully. And as I said, the, the integration of the making of the tea in the film is is really splendid. This is, Making Sweet Tea is a very powerful watershed film for many reasons, not least because it really presents the experiences of a number of different Black gay men of the American South, and it does so with humanizing force. It becomes very clear that the experiences that they've had and the relationships that they've created have been very rich and life-changing. Uh, what was it like to capture the most treasured aspects of their lives? You've talked about some of that in the, in the technical sense. And you said a few minutes earlier that as you were made to realize that you really needed to share your own story, that you gained a new appreciation for what you were asking of them. What, what were you asking of them? And how did you know that you needed to iterate this work from being first a book and a play into what is now a film? Yeah, so whenever you, you know, approach projects like this, um, you don't, you, you have an idea of what you want to find, but you never know what you're going to find. Um, I had a wonderful professor in graduate school named Emily Toth, um, whose class I took, um, I was on feminist biography or something like that. And uh, we all had to do uh, a biography. And, and she said to us before we started our project, she said, don't go into to the field with an ax to grind go in feeling for the organism. And what she meant by that was, yeah, you, you have your set of questions that are, are, are driving the research, but also allow your subjects to share things that you may not have even considered asking. And so one of the th things that I sort of, evolved over the course of, of, of doing the interviews with uh, these men is that many of them already had a story to tell, um, but no one had ever asked them about any aspect of their life. And so, it, you know, the number of times I got um, the response, you want my story? I, you know, I don't have a story, you know? And then of course you get a Charles story. <laughs> you get a Duncan story, you get a Freddie story. Um, and so for me, the, the, the impulse to do this uh, project in the first place to interview these men was actually goes back uh, to 1995 when I was visiting uh, a friend of mine in Washington, D.C., who had taken me to um, uh, a cookout held by an organization called Us Helping Us, People Into Living Incorporating, Incorporated. And um, Us Helping Us was founded by the now deceased uh, Ron Simmons, who was an uh, educator, HIV AIDS uh, activist, and who was HIV positive for 40 years. And at that event were uh, these older gentlemen, uh, you know, I would say the average age was like 70 or so. And they were, they were seated, you know, not too far away from my um, table, sitting around telling lies and joking about uh, 
life back in the day. And all of them were from the South. And I, you know, as this 20 something year old, um, you know, still not necessarily out, but not closeted either, but I, you know, I wasn't where I needed to be. I was hearing these stories and I was just like a little kid uh, hanging on to every word because they were so fascinating to me that A, all these men were from the South and we're talking about folks who were born in the thirties and forties, uh, and um, but who were describing a world that I had no knowledge of. Um, and that is a world where not only black gay men in the South existed, but also thrived. And I knew that if I, as a, a young black gay man who was born and raised in the South, had heard those stories, been able to access those stories, I may not have struggled with my sexuality in the way that I did because I would have realized that I wasn't the only one. Mm -hmm. And so I knew then that it was important that those stories be lifted, that they um, be shared in some way. And so that's, that was the sort of seed for the project. And again, I, I had a, you know, I think I started out with a set of 19 questions that I asked everybody. Um, and then that list grew uh, ultimately to like close to 50. But I also just learned to listen very carefully and not be afraid of silence. Uh, a lot of interviewers are afraid of silence and I wasn't um, because what's happening in silence is people are thinking, they're, they're reflecting. And so just giving people time and space to sort of let their story unfold. And with some people, um, you know, one question and then we're off to the races. Two hours later, I might get to ask the next one. <laughs> and with others, you know, it, there was a little more prodding. But I never, um, I never sort of went in with an agenda uh, to get people to say, certain things. I sort of let those interviews go where they wanted to go. And what happened is over the over those um, 77 men that I interviewed, certain themes started to emerge uh, across those narratives. Um, one was, you know, their struggle with religion uh, or their relationships with their parents or siblings. Um, their relationship to the South itself as a region, um, their uh, process of, of coming out or not. So there were certain themes that sort of ran across all of them um, that then ultimately guided how I put the book together. And, you know, for as long as Sweet Tea is, you know, 600 pages, I, I have enough material <laughs> from those original interviews. There could have been another 600 pages because there's so much um, that, they, um, that they shared that I couldn't include in the book. So the other piece of your question is, how does that affect the film? One of the things I think the film does that the book can't do is provide um, viewers with uh, more texture, more context uh, for how some of these men evolved over the course of their lives because you get to see where they're living. Uh, you get to hear the sounds, uh, you know, um, you get to you know, you can't smell the, the, the food, but you get a sense of what that kitchen smells like. Um, and for me, most importantly, you get to hear them speaking in their own voice. It's not me performing their voice. It's not me um, transcribing their voice in the book. You actually get to see them telling their story. So I think that uh, that extra layering provides um, a really rich experience for people who won't pick up the book, who won't come see the play, 
uh, it gives you a, um, a different kind of insight into the lives of these men and, and my life as well. Well, the, the power of the work as art and its rendering and through the film, uh, through the performances you've done, the plays as well as the, the Sweet Tea, the book, in addition to the many other books that you've done is, is really powerful. Uh, you tend to be pretty humble, you Patrick, but we should recognize the tremendous leadership that you have uh, because you you have become arguably the most important scholar in uh, in black queer studies and even queer studies more broadly. People who who are studying this material, uh, who are interested in even training, uh, seek you out as mentor. Uh, your work as a performer has been impactful globally, uh, let alone within the United States. And uh, it's, it's not surprising to me, you've been recently appointed as a dean of the School of Communication. Uh, you have multiple degrees, you know, you did a bachelor's and master's degree at UNC Chapel Hill, your, your PhD in communications, uh, particularly the power of your work is, is been impactful, not just for academic audiences, but also much more broadly. And that's, that's clearly only a celebrate now with uh, the creation of this film and and i'm wondering you've so you've been leading something called the black arts initiative for many years and so when i uh, open by describing you as a as a scholar and artist which is how you represent yourself it's not just that you have been a performing artist uh, but you've also produced your impact by structuring and institutionalizing art as something uh, for the public to encounter and to appreciate it and to curate it. Could you say something about your role with the Black Arts Initiative and how it has informed or shaped the work that you're doing now? Yeah, so the, the Black Arts Initiative is a, an idea that I came uh, up with uh, in 20. 11, when Northwestern was a, about to um, start a capital campaign and was, you know, asking for ideas about where to invest resources. And as I, uh, you know, sort of looked across the landscape of, of Northwestern, I realized that there were so many people working um, on the Black arts, whether it be my, my colleagues in the English department, uh, doing a creative uh, writing or literature or uh, folks focusing on film or music, dance, um, theater, performance studies, uh, art history. We had so many people um, here working on the black arts, but we were all working in silos. People didn't know what the other was doing. And I also knew that, you know, we needed a way to engage the community um, outside of the university, because you know Chicago has this rich artistic uh, community and specifically black uh, arts community. Um, so many wonderful um, arts, in, black arts institutions in Chicago. And I felt that there need to be more collaboration with those uh, institutions and so I uh, started the Black Arts Initiative and we didn't call it the Black Arts Institute because we had no money and it wasn't a, a brick and mortar kind of thing. Uh, and it wasn't quite a center. It literally was an initiative uh, to bring folks together. And so now it's been eight years uh, and uh, in 2021, we will have a brick and mortar space um, in downtown Chicago. Uh, which is great. Um, but the, there were sort of uh, four pillars to the Black Arts Initiative. One was um, to um, bring folks together around research uh, in the Black Arts. Another was pedagogy, how we teach Black Arts. Uh, one was civic engagement, uh, you know, how we um, uh, 
made sure that we were um, engaging the surrounding communities, including arts institutions, um, into what we were doing at Northwestern. And then the other was actually producing work because uh, we have a lot of, of people besides myself who are active artists. Um, and so that's what we've been doing. We have this thing called Black Arts in the City where we take students and faculty into the city of Chicago to see black art. Uh, we have a um, artist in residency program where we host artists uh, for a period of time. We have a um, brown bag luncheon where we feature works in progress by our faculty um, and we, uh, until recently we had a postdoc program, um, but we've in the past we've had like six postdocs um, come through as well. So it's a way to um, sort of harness all of the, the research and um, creative work here at Northwestern around the black arts, but also uh, in our outward facing um, side to engage um, the community and um, moving forward, we're actually changing the name to the Black Arts Consortium because one of the things we're doing is collaborating with institutions around the world, uh, starting with South Africa, the Bahamas uh, and um, Puerto Rico. Um, and so the, the idea will be to uh, have exchange programs where scholars and artists will come to Northwestern. We will send people to those institutions. We'll collaborate on exhibitions and uh, a number of different uh, things. But yeah, so we're we're thinking globally now. And um, but it started with a little seed because I've always been a big tent kind of person, uh, trying to uh, make space for folks to come together uh, to create to think together. And um, that's how I'm most productive, thinking with uh, other people as opposed to off in a little corner somewhere. Um, so that was uh, the idea for the Black Arts Initiative. Well, it's it's been incredibly impactful, the work that you've done already with the Black Arts Initiative. It's exciting to hear about where you're going with this. Yes, I'm really, really excited as well. The, the work that art can do is clearly evidenced in, in this very moving film, as well as your, your other work and output. You know, as you were talking, I was reminded of something, Patrick, I was reading recently, it was an essay on the role of the creative artist that James Baldwin mm. uh, wrote back in, I think this maybe in the early 60s, uh, this guy published. And, and he says several things about what he thinks the, the creative artist is supposed to do and what defines that role. And one of the things he talks about is that the, the creative artist doesn't accept the face value of society, that society easily believes uh, what it might wanna believe about things, but the creative artist is supposed to pierce beneath the surface and find out what's really going on and tell the truth about it even if the world doesn't want to hear it <laughs> and and some people might think that maybe that's too utilitarian to talk about the role of the artist if you ask 10 people what's the role of the creative artist you know you probably get 15 different answers but it but it did in in listening to you talk now and in reflecting on on the film that we screened over the weekend i was just really struck by that because there's there's so many times in this film that the stories that we see and the voices that we hear, in some ways they, they, they can affirm some of the common perceptions that people might have about uh, Black gay identity within the context of the American South. And in other ways, they can really unsettle or challenge some of those uh, some of those common perceptions. And, and one of those instances for me is when Countess Vivian, he reflects uh, somewhat wistfully on the early 20th century 
And he notes really casually that he said there were, oh, there were lots of gay men back then. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, almost in the sense of, of not that that was the golden era, but that I'm almost counter to the idea where there surely there is a much more public black gay culture now than there was in the early 20th century. And to hear him talk about it, it's it's very clear from his memory and experiences. No, there were, there were lots of people back then and there was a immense culture and he talks about what that was like. And so it was just one of the many moments in the film where there's, uh, there's a, a challenge to some of the easy ways that people might be more familiar with perceiving the South uh, within the context of, of being Black and gay. Can you talk about how the film mixes a challenge to some of these perceptions uh, with the confirmation of other perceptions as viewers are taken on a journey? through the lives of these men. Yeah, this, it's interesting, Sylvester, because one of the things, one of my motivations for the book was to dispel a lot of myths about uh, what it might mean to be Black and gay in the South. Because for some people, being Black and gay in the South, th that's an, uh, you know, an anathema in and of itself. There ain't no black gay people in the South. Um, so it was important to me that I find uh, folks who were not only sort of existing, but also thriving um, to counter that narrative that if there are black gay men in the South, they're all uh, uh, on the DL. Mm -hmm. um, or you know they're 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 not self actualized. On the other hand, to also um, show even if they are they don't disclose their sexuality in a public way, that that doesn't mean they're necessarily self hating. Mm. That there are other nuanced political um, cultural reasons why one may not uh, announce their sexuality. Um, and that it's all good. It, you know, it, it takes all of that to, to create a community that there, it's not a monolithic community. Um, but the other piece of it is um, there are so many stereotypes about, you know, what people think of when they think of black gay men, you know, from, you know, the hairdresser, Charles fits that description, that stereotype. But not many people are going to um, necessarily then think of someone like Duncan, who is a minister, mm -hmm. um, who has a congregation who uh, accepts him and, and admires him and uh, reveres him. Um, there are not too many people, as you were mentioning, who would imagine that in the 1920s and 30s in New Orleans, that there would be a thriving uh, Black gay community and Black trans community. You know, these uh, Black trans sex workers who were, you know, setting up these shotgun houses and um, uh, you know, swindling the, these white male patrons out of their money. Um, that's a really, to me, it was just a fascinating part of history that I had no clue about. And yet here is someone like Countess Vivian um, saying, oh yeah. And sort of kind of as an aside, of course there were. <laughs> Um, and who lived through all of that. Um, so for me, I wanted the film to uh, show the both and rather than the either or, and also show the, the tensions, you know, that despite um, being self-actualized that all of these men had some kind of personal struggle, no matter where they are now, 
that they had to sort of maneuver, including myself, um, that we all had to maneuver that landscape that is the South, which includes Black folk who might be accepting to you um, as long as you don't announce <laughs> who you are, um, or uh, really intense relationships with your mother uh, or your siblings, um, or the fact that, uh, not or, and the fact that our sexuality does not uh, uh, sort of shelter us from experiences of racism. That's why it was very important for us to include the ways in which black gay men are also um, subject to police brutality and violence. Um, also, we wanted to make sure that uh, class cleav cleavages were represented, that you know, we're not, uh, you know, all, we don't, we don't either all come from uh, abject poverty, but we also don't all, you know, uh, some of us also come from middle-class uh, backgrounds. So we are a part of the, the patchwork quilt that is the South. And the hope is that the film, um, touches upon that or, or, or brings that to the fore that it's not a monolithic culture uh, and that um, you can't sort of put black gay men in the South in a box, uh, that it is more dynamic than that and um, the world is more complicated than that. So hopefully that's what the film does, or at least that was the intention. Yeah, no, it certainly delivers. I mean, that's very clear, very clear. In a few minutes, we want to invite our viewers to send any questions you might have live, and we'll have some Q&A with our audience. Uh, but before we turn to those questions, so you can send those now if you wish. But before we turn to those questions, I wanted to ask you uh, to think, looking back in retrospect on this film, uh, as, as we've seen, Making Sweet Tea has already garnered multiple film awards. And so it must be really gratifying to see how this long process over five years has come to fruition and to have the work meet with such positive reception. As you look back in retrospect, is there anything that you would have done differently or that you now perceive differently concerning the film project? Well, you know, that, that's an interesting um, question, Sylvester, because, you know, hindsight, as they say, is always twenty twenty. I mean, given that the film wasn't my idea, um, that's a hard question for me to uh, answer because um, I never imagined that it would even be a play, let alone a film. You know, my, my goal was to collect these oral histories and get this book out. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't until I started meeting these um, wonderful storytellers that I re realized that, you know, this can't just be words on a page. These, this has to be a performance of some sort. Mm -hmm. But John Jackson, when he first saw the, the play uh, in, Chicago when it premiered here over a decade ago, he was like, this is really interesting. It's really fascinating to, to see how you've turned this oral history and ethnographic project into a place. So I think it'd be a, make a great film about the process of, of that. And then of course, as with all projects, when you start doing it, it becomes so much more <laughs> than that. So we ended up with the film that we ended up with. I guess though, having, having been on these, these shoots when we're filming, um, I, th I think if we had just, just kept the camera rolling the whole time, we could have captured so many other um, things that uh, would have been interesting, the things that, you know, um, just happen when you are just, living in the world. And um, that's probably one thing. Um, 
but you know, the, the other thing is, um, and I hope I don't become too um, sentimental here. Um, I wish we had been able to capture Harold making tea. Um, mm -hmm. The reason I say that is because uh, we had flown down to see him, to film him making tea. And um, Harold Herman had already passed away a year before. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this was uh, December of, of, tw of 2017. Harold um, Herman passed away in December of 2016. So we had flown down to um, film Harold Mays making tea and he was in the hospital mm -hmm. and he never made it out. Um, so they died within a year of each other. Uh, and I think Harold Mays from a broken heart. Um, I I regret not being able to have him uh, making tea uh, for the for the film, and that he never got a chance to see the film. Um, that's the other thing, Sylvester. What this film in particular has um, demonstrated to all of us is how. Um, important it is to document uh, the lives of people while they're still with us. Uh, so since the film is out, uh, Countess Vivian, both of the Heralds and my mother mm -hmm. all passed away. Uh, so they're immortalized of course in the film, but you know, my mother passed away um, just uh, two months before we um, premiered the film. Um, so having something like this to, to pay tribute to her, uh, and one of my favorite moments in the film is her talking about her husband. Because <laughs> that, you know, at one point, some, one of our consultants was like, oh, well, we don't really need that scene. I said, we are not cutting that scene. <laughs> it cracks me up every time. She says, no, 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 I don't want to talk about it. And then she starts to talk about it. <laughs> I remember that. It's very poignant. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that on camera. And then she says, <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, it is moving. Uh, I was, I was watching this uh, with my, my partner the other evening we were screening and she was, you know, she really noted that you, the film at the end, it actually, um, has a tribute and acknowledgement of the people who who have passed uh, and who didn't get to see this film. And even Cleopatra, uh, the cat is 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 there as part of the or the dog. I think it's the dog, yeah. dog yeah. is Freddy's there dog. part of the tribute. And and my partner said, see, he's really a good listener. <laughs> Because in the film, of course, uh, there's a discussion about how important it was to have this pet. Yeah, for Freddie. And the loss yeah. of a partner and the loss of a spouse. Yeah. And that was, was really telling uh, that yeah, at the level of doing the tributes that the dog is there for that reason, because this was actually a part of the very treasured experiences that people had. So it's also um, a really, I think, telling observation about your work again as an ethnographer in really paying attention and listening and capturing these experiences. Uh, well, we have, we have some audience questions and we want to include some time for you to respond to uh, what people, our listeners have been asking. And one is a question from Najla Mutrek who says she was particularly moved by Charles's story and is wondering how you perceive the ways these men reconcile the conflicts between religious beliefs from childhood and their journey of self-acceptance and expression. You know, well, I think I can speak for most of the men um, and it include myself. It's, it's not a, not an end, the, the journey continues because as much as I've sort of um, 
renounce is too harsh of a word, distance myself from um, religion and um, religious institutions in particular, I would be lying if I didn't say that, you know, I am still very much of the church because <laughs> I, I grew up there, you know, and um, I love singing gospel music. I'm still moved by it. Um, and I love uh, a good hooping preacher uh, from time to time. Um, so I know that uh, for most of these men who were also raised in that context, that um, the reconciliation of one's sexuality and um, spirituality is an ongoing process. Because uh, I think for all of us, it's, it's not the case that all of religion was bad. It was how it was um, put to use um, to um, make us feel othered uh, in an otherwise uh, presumptive uh, embracing community. And so the way in which we have all decided to deal with that contradiction varies, you know, I don't go to church. Um, Charles still goes to church. Duncan is a minister. Um, Freddie only goes to church to find a man, <laughs> as he says. Um, Sean, I think, is a church goer. Um, you know, Countess Vivian was a devout Catholic. Um, so, you know, it really varied from person to person, but I think that process is, is an ongoing one. Mm -hmm. We also have a question from Lee. Uh, the, referring to uh, your mentioning of simultaneous truths. And, and Lee asked, did you mean something like what is illustrated in the old story of the blind men filling different parts of an elephant where each of them has a little bit of what's going on or did you have something else in mind in talking about simultaneous truths? Well, I, I often use that phrasing because um, people think that multiple things can't be true at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so for instance, you know, there are lots and lots of good people in the world, but good, good people often do horrible things. <laughs> and so sometimes people are shocked when they learn that such and such who's, you know, otherwise has been, you know, sweet person, what has done this horrible thing. And so we, we are, human and so we are uh we're not perfect beings and so i i know that someone can um speak what they believe is their truth that runs counter to someone else's experience um who shared that same event with them mm -hmm. so when I'm doing research, I'm not out for the truth with a capital T. I'm out for that person's truth as the way they see it, because that's interesting to me to try to understand A, um, how someone tells their story and B, why, they're, um, why they might tell it that way. That's really more interesting to, to me than the verisimilitude of the thing that they're um, telling. It doesn't mean that it's a lie per se, but it's it's their truth, it's their reality. And for me as a, as a scholar, I'm interested in how people narrate the truth of their lives as they, as they see it. So I often say, I believe in simultaneous truths. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. Oh, we have another question from uh, Kenneth who asks, do you have any advice for university programs or departments that want to have sustained community engagement? In particular, how do we effectively invite in more diverse voices? Well, I, I think the fact that uh, Kenneth is asking the question is the, is the first steps, because some people, you know, 
I didn't want to turn this political, but here we are. You know, the fact that we have a president who um, just <laughs> on Friday um, put out an executive order banning uh, diversity training in the federal government is an indication that there, that he does not want any kind of conversation about bringing people in or, or understanding different experiences. So um, yeah. having the will is the first step, having the uh, wherewithal to, to, to realize that um, not everyone, uh, not everyone's voice is being included. So that's step number one. Step number two is actually um, initiating partnerships with um, non-university institutions. You know, that was again, part of the, the um, goal of mine for the Black Arts Initiative is reaching out to uh, community uh, organizations who are, you know, was, or within a stone's throw of the university, but has never been engaged by the university. Uh, and so that's a way to bring in voices from the community in, because I always think it's really important to have uh, people who aren't students, who aren't faculty on our campuses. It's quite a reality check, <laughs> actually, uh, because you get to hear from people whose investments are very different. Uh, in the community and who don't have the same access to the resources and wealth that some of these uh, universities do, but who are brilliant and can teach us so much about how to teach mm -hmm. and how to do research. So those kinds of collaborations are really important. And the other thing I'll say is um, we also have to, I think, reorient our pedagogy so that our students are actually um, interested in moving beyond the walls of the uh, university uh, to gain knowledge. Um, you know, at a place like Northwestern, we, you know, we have two campuses, but the main campus is in Evanston in a suburb. And it's very rare that the students venture beyond um, the immediate campus. And so I try to get my students into the city of Chicago at uh, places where they wouldn't necessarily go if they weren't you know, being required to, um, to get a different perspective so that we aren't living in this bubble um, uh, at, the, at the university. And I think it helps um, students get a, a different more nuanced understanding of the world writ large uh, than you know the sort of elite white um, academic institution where you know they don't have to speak to the people who clean the very floors where they learn. Mm -hmm. um, I could never do that because my mother and my grandmother were housekeepers, mm -hmm. so I know to respect those people and I know the hard work that they do, but. I think um, our students and, and some of our faculty take those things for granted, but we can learn a lot from those folks and engaging them, I think is really, really important. Hmm. Well, we also have a question from Stephanie uh, who asked how the questions in the documentary differed from those you initially prepared for the interview. Oh, that's a great question. Um, they're very different because um, when we started shooting the film, 10 years had passed, um, or almost 10 years had passed since the original interview. So we were living in a different um, cultural context and definitely a different political context. Um, for the original interviews, George uh, W. Bush had just been uh, reelected. Um, so there was a lot of um, really horrible things going on then. And, you know, it's so weird to think that he seems mild mannered <laughs> in this context, but um, there were lots of things going on uh, with that administration during the time that I um, conducted these interviews, which was 
between 2004 and 2006. And then we started filming in 2013, I think it was, uh, 2013 to 2014. So, you know, Barack Obama had been elected as president. Um, we then we had uh, marriage equality. So a number of different things that had changed. So we were really interested in a kind of retrospective of how these men's lives had changed since the original interview. So a number of the questions were guided by what has happened uh, over the last 10 years? How has your life changed uh, over the last 10 years? And so uh, one of the examples I can give is, well, of course, Charles, but also the Heralds, you know, a couple who had been together for 50 years and all of a sudden marriage equality is available to them and they decide to get married. Um, so those are the ways in which the, the questions change. And uh, Stephanie also had a follow-up. Will there be a documentary film for Honeypot? Oh, that's funny that you said that. We first got to get a performance going. Uh, <laughs> there will be a performance of some sort. Um, I will not be doing it. Um, I'm, I'm trying to uh, get one of my director friends to uh, adapt Honey Pot for the stage. Uh, the first performative component of Honey Pot, though, is a um, uh, audio book. I uh, got several um, uh, Black women to, who are actresses, some of them are, are graduate students, to read different parts uh, of the book for the audio book. So we hope that that will be out in the fall, later this fall. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that we actually have a performance of Honey Pot at some point. The film part, I'm sure there'll be something. I just don't know what yet. Mm -hmm. well, so we have a question from Erica who asked, do you have recommendations? for scholars who are looking to uplift the voices and experiences of underrepresented communities who don't identify as a member of that particular community, especially in terms of visible differences such as race, but also being thoughtful about the damage that research has done to particular communities in the past. Yeah, so there, again, there is a whole, whole <laughs> uh, body of literature about um, particularly, you know, white WASP um, men doing uh, ethnographic research, particularly in Africa or other um, places around the world, or even, you know, on indigenous communities here in uh, the United States. Um, so that extant literature is, is rich with, you know, and, um, there's there's a lot of um, anti-colonial um, research around that. Um, the the research that I um, or I should say the approach, my methodology for uh, ethnography comes from performance studies, mm -hmm. uh, which we call performance ethnography, which acknowledges um, the um, the power differential between a researcher and the research, but also um, views the uh, ethnographic encounter as a performance mm -hmm. that we're performing for each other and we are co-performative witnesses. Um, and a lot of that work comes from uh, Dwight Conkergood, who was a um, performance ethnographer who hired me. He was a, a faculty member in performance studies at Northwestern. And uh, he passed away in 2004, but the book that Sylvester referenced um, in his introduction, Cultural Struggles, uh, that would be a great book uh, to start uh, because it's a collection of Dwight's essays that um, really help um, people who are just doing this kind of work methodologically to um, work through some of the ethical and moral um, questions around doing this kind of research when you don't belong to, uh, you're not a member of that community or you uh, don't share 
every aspect of that person's um, uh, subject position. Um, so I would start there. And then my other colleague, um, D. Soyini Madison, has a book called Critical Ethnography. And it is, it is really written as a how-to um, book. Uh, to do this kind of work with examples and so on and so forth. So I would start with those. Mm -hmm. That's terrific. Uh, we have a question from Rachel who asked, how did you select which stories to tell in the film? Um, that was fairly easy uh, because it came down to who would participate. <laughs> um, you know, we didn't know, for instance, if we were going to, if Charles would agree to participate. And as I said before, um, uh, after having not participated in any of the other forms, uh, he decided to. Um, but the we first started with um, the men whose stories I had performed in the play. Uh, because again, the idea originally for the film uh, was to create a film about the making of the play. So we started with, um, I think I do 11 different men in the play. So reaching out to them to see who would agree to be a part of the film. Um, and then um, we went from there. And part of it too was um, some of the people that we wanted to be a part of the film actually ended up not being a part of it because we ran out of money. <laughs> Uh, to uh, do the film, or they changed their minds about um, being in it. Well, we have a question from Roderick, who, who asked something uh, lots of people who are, might be asking if they saw the screening or if they didn't get to see the screening. And that is, uh, first, he thanks you for the conversation, but asks also, is making sweet tea available or streaming on any platform or people didn't get to see the screening or did but want to see it in the future, how might they be able to? So those of you who got to see it uh, this weekend are very special uh, because it is not public. Um, we are now making the film festival circuit and um, that will come to an end actually this fall. But uh, next for the next three weekends, uh, the film will be screened uh, at different film festivals um, around the world. Uh, we, we screened in India, in Mumbai. Uh, we're screening in Toronto. Uh, we're screening uh, in Hickory, my hometown, uh, in the Foot uh, Candle Festival. So if anyone did not see the film, they can go to the website, makingsweetteafilm.com. And you can see all the places where we're, uh, where the film is being screened in festivals. We are also uh, right now in negotiations with a distributor. I can't say who, <clears throat> Netflix, um, but uh, <laughs> we're hoping that uh, we will uh, get a distributor uh, so that the film can be uh, available on demand uh, soon. We'll see, but fingers, toes, everything is is crossed um, that we will be on a an international platform um, soon. And we also have a question from uh, another another individual who wants to know what advice you would offer to future filmmakers. Um. One of the things I've learned um, in this process is that, you know, anyone can make a film. You know, you know, there are films shot on um, cell phones, uh, like literally, uh, the whole things are are shot on cell phones. I think the and so you should not be limited by your lack of access to resources. I think that. The challenge is if you want to make a feature film, that is much more challenging to do than a short. Um, there are many more venues uh, for short films. 
Um, and short is uh, in, in film parlance, I've learned this over the course of the last few years, is anything under 40 minutes. But I've seen films as short as seven minutes, five minutes. Um, those are much more, um, those are easier to, to get out into the world and into film festivals. In fact, there are some festivals that are uh, only for short films. Um, if you want to do a feature, um, I would say you can still, you know, get as much footage. You know, I said, we you know, we had 80 hours of footage, uh, which is a lot, but you would rather have more than not enough because you never know what kind of um, B-roll you might need for, and uh, for those of you who don't know what B-roll is, it's um, uh, any kind of, of image that is used that for uh, while someone is talking. So I might be narrating uh, uh, about walking down the road in Hickory and all of a sudden we see me walking down the, the railroad in Hickory while I'm talking. You don't see me, but you see me walking. So that kind of footage uh, is, it helps tell the story. Um, so I would say shoot as much as possible and then decide, you know, what is the story you want to tell? It's interesting to me that how much editing <laughs> plays such a huge role in uh, filmmaking. You can tell any kind of story you want to tell. You can make people say things <laughs> um, by editing. Um, it's all in the editing. It's all smoke and mirrors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And we have one more question from one of our viewers who asked, is there any symbolic importance to the railroad? Mm. So this is, this is part of the opening uh, of the film, the closing. Yes. Um, for me personally, the, the symbolism of that uh, railroad, and I, I've actually written about this in um, an essay um, a few years ago. As I said before, that railroad symbolized the dividing line between black and white in Hickory. And crossing that railroad to the north side of town meant crossing into a world that was at once foreign and dangerous uh, for many black folk. And yet many had to do it. Uh, and most of the folks who had to do it were people like my mother and my grandmother who had to cross that railroad track to go clean white folks' houses. And um, Hickory in particular is divided into quadrants like um, Washington, DC. So I grew up, as you know in the um, film, at 229 8th Avenue Drive Southwest. So it's these quadrants. So South, Southwest Hickory in particular was the area of town where the majority of black people lived. Uh, there were a few people in Southeast Hickory, but uh, Northwest and Northeast, there weren't black people, mostly because we weren't allowed. So the that railroad track is about crossing a threshold into another space, another world. But also uh, the railroad track symbolically uh, has specific meaning for black folk in general. I mean, it's a common trope in African-American literature, for instance, you know, from the underground railroad to um, people um, jumping on a, a railroad track, um, hiding out, uh, hoping that it will get them to freedom. Um, you know, to August Wilson plays two trains running. I mean, you know, to the um, um, the Pullman Porter uh, workers on on the railroad. So, yes, it has lots of symbolism on a number of different levels. No, that's great. Well, we have just a few minutes left, and you you've been uh, it's really amazing sharing with us so much of what has gone into creating this film and shaping it and the experiences from us, really the set of scholarly perspectives that have 
gone into deciding the methods and data collection, uh, the very personal aspects of this, the uh, the creative aspect as well, and the different ways that you've iterated uh, the work from your ethnography. Um, before we go, I, I want to ask you to talk a little bit more about something that you mentioned earlier, and that is the, the importance of your mother, mm. uh, because it's, it's very clear that, that the, the film introduces us to the lives of several different Black men of the South, and we learn about their relationships and their stories. Uh, but it's really beautifully woven together with your own story. And, and one thing that you show us uh, in your featuring of your mother and the conversations with her is that, is that she's a very central part of your story. Uh, so could you say a little bit about that? Yeah, so my, my mother uh, is really the, the person who instilled in me everything um, that I needed to make it to where I am today. And I credit her with that. And this is a woman who um, did not get past the 10th grade. And yet she was one of the smartest, brilliant, most brilliant people that I, that I know. Um, she was very organized. Um, and I get that from her as well. When right before she passed away, when we had moved her to a um, care facility, we're going through my mother's um, thing. She lived in the same apartment, the same two bedroom apartment where she's making that sweet tea for 32 years. So you can only imagine all the things we found. But one of the interesting things that we discovered in cleaning out her place is that my mother had a file, meaning a box, on each of her children. And each of those um, files contained everything from um, driver's license and permits, um, baptismal certificates, you know, when we were christened or baptized. Um, for me, there was uh, a program from any performance she ever attended. Um, and everything was uh, very neatly arranged and labeled and some things were put in Ziploc bags and but it was all very um, neat. We had no idea that my mother had been keeping all of these things on her children. And um, what that told me is that in her own way, she was proud of us um, for the people that we were individually, you know, she loved us all, of course, but she did not have the same kinds of expectations for, for all of us. And I'm the youngest of seven, so it was a lot of kids. Um, and so she was so smart and such a um, intuitive person. And I think I get a lot of, my ethnographic um, uh, sensibilities from her. You know, my mother could really sense the energy in a room. She could uh, discern um, what was going on without saying a word. She was just a good uh, listener. And um, so I, I credit her with a lot of, um, of who I am today. And so my next project actually is going to be a memoir, but that's actually, it's a memoir, but it'll be a, a, a memoir that's actually an autobiography of my mother. Mm -hmm. um, and, and told through photographs and uh, through other kinds of um, ephemera that um, she's left behind. And so some of it will be creative nonfiction um, where I'm imagining um, her life through the things that she left behind, including her baby boy. Wow, that is going to be exciting to read. You know, as you talk about your mother and the files that she kept, it, it's striking to me that she was creating an archive. 
uh, for children, which is what yeah. you've done with the lives of the people whom you have interviewed over the years. You've created this archive that makes it possible for us to be able to understand and learn from their lives. Um, but your your mother was doing that, so that is striking. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uncanny. <laughs> wow. Very moving. Well, one just one last question before you go. So you to say that you are prolific, P. Patrick, is an understatement. I was I was uh, crafting the introduction and and just thinking about all of the work that you've produced and. The publications themselves are numerous. I didn't even mention articles. <laughs> those, were, those were books that I named. Uh, but in addition to that is the other work that you've done. So you, you're a performer. So as you've mentioned, you've been doing a lot of performances of the plays. And now there is the film in addition to those other things. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of our, our viewers, uh, particularly those of the academic ilk, are probably wondering what magic juice do you drink every month? <laughs> <laughs> and can we order it on Amazon? <laughs> so um, I would, can you say a little bit about how you work? Because I'm inspired when I see the work that you're doing. Uh, a lot of times people will easily think that uh, either one can commit themselves to scholarly productivity or they can participate in leadership at their institutions. Uh, but you've clearly done both. You've, you've led academic departments, African-American studies, performance studies. Uh, you've done the Black Arts Initiative for uh, many years now, and you're about to take that to the next level. Uh, now you're, you're the dean of a school of communication. Uh, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if we're reading this memoir autobiography of your mother next year that you've done. <laughs> you will not. <laughs> that productivity is profound and it's inspiring to see someone who embodies these these ways of engaging and being impactful across genres, but also uh, being able to, to participate in leadership and, and craft the time so that they can produce the work that they're very passionate and committed about. So what, what helps you to do this? How do you, how do you what are the, the secrets or the strategies or how does this happen? Community. Um, I, you know, I am a bit of a workaholic, it, it is true. Uh, and, you know, I should sleep more than I do. But um, I will say that, you know, I've had a number of opportunities to um, leave Northwestern. I, I'm beginning my 21st year here. And the reason I haven't um, left is because of the community that I have. And anytime I've, you know, been sort of um, enticed by another institution, I've leveraged that interest uh, from another institution here at Northwestern to build more communities. So that's how I got support for the Black Arts Initiative. So having um, colleagues and students who are engaged with me um, in a collaborative process actually makes um, producing the work that I do a lot easier because they're there to help bounce off, uh, to, to bounce ideas off of. Um, they're there sometimes on stage with me. You know, I've directed students uh, in shows. Um, I'm constantly learning from my students, from my graduate students. Um, so for me, the, the sense of, of collaboration is so very important. And it really keeps me buoyed because I think so much of of the work that we do as academics in particular is isolating. You know, it's us in a room staring at a blinking cursor uh, and it can be very um, isolating. And to have the opportunity then to um, share the work while it's in process uh, with others 
is something that I don't take for granted because I know that not everybody has that to be able to pick up the phone and say, you know, hey, Sylvester, can you read this for me? Or um, call a friend and say, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, I'm working on this script. I wanna, you know, bounce some ideas uh, off of you. Um, I'm not going to say that it has always been easy to produce at this high level, in addition to uh, doing administration, in addition to um, advising graduate students, uh, in addition to being a husband, um, and in addition to um, my family obligations. Because, you know, I tell people often that for many Black people, and y'all just saw where I came from, you know, eight people living in a one bedroom um, apartment. Um, for those of us who finally do arrive uh, in middle class status, it's always nebulous because our wealth is going back to support uh, our families. And so it's not moving forward necessarily. And so um, I, and I don't, I'm, I don't say that to, to, to be noble or anything, but you know, I feel that, that it's just as my mother, you know, scrubbed floors uh, and worked on a uh, worked in a factory to pay for me to go through school. I feel an obligation to to help my family, and so all of those things though are pulling at you, sometimes all at once, and uh, to help you through that is is really important that you have community. And again, if you don't have community. Uh, and I didn't in, in certain places I've worked, um, you know, Amherst College was one of them. You have to build it. Um, and so one of the things that I've tried to do as an administrator um, is build something where people will come join me uh, in the playground. Well, that is inspiring. And on that note, uh, we wanna thank you, Dr. E. Patrick Johnson, the creator of making sweet tea uh, for your generosity and sharing with us uh, some of the profound ways that you've been able to have such a powerful impact through your writing, through your performance, and most recently through this film. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.